yesterday we spoke about novels and we we, we uh, discussed how mulkraj anand raja rao and rk narayan became the trio who set foundations on the way in which the indian novel or the indian prose fiction was to function similarly when it comes to poem there are three writers who are often club together and discuss together one is quite familiar to all of you ak ramanujan you may have learned him during your school days or uh, during your grad days and he may be really familiar to you another in that list is r parthasarathi who hails from chennai uh, tamil nadu trichirappalli sorry not chennai from trichy which is in tamil nadu and the third in that list of trio is uh, jayanta mahapatra another indian english poet who is or who hails from the state of odisha these three people are often uh, considered together for their contributions to indian english in the latter half of the 20th century i'm not following the chronology while teaching poems because uh, that may not really be fruitful the poems that i'm discussing in the class at least in this initial sessions are poems which have become part of the annotations in the previous year question papers so that's something that has been given emphasis on and the moment i come up with certain pieces that's also because they are recurringly uh, asked in the previous year question paper and that's the reason why i stress on certain authors and certain poems i try to bring in some thematic unity for instance the other day when i discussed poems i try to discuss a couple of poems by uh, madhavi kuti or kamala das for that sake and uh, that's something that i try to focus on but that apart i am not using that chronology i have not gone to sarojini naidu for instance or have not followed that chronology i am taking people for the sake of convenience all right doesn't matter okay so uh, so these three people uh, are parthasarathi ak ramanujan and jayanta mahapatra were instrumental in defining or in taking english poetry to new heights talking about jayanta mahapatra you may be familiar with him uh, there is a privilege that he enjoys what is something unique about jayanta mahapatra in terms of honors received can anybody elaborate a little bit on that the peculiarity that he has is anyone aware of the uniqueness that jayanta mahapatra possesses in terms of accolades okay doesn't that it happens uh, jayanta mahapatra is the first indian to win a sahitya academy award for writing in english he was also later bestowed with the padma shri award and uh, he returned it due to the political scenarios in india post 2014 but nonetheless sahitya academy the first indian to win the sahitya academy award for writing in english jayanta mahapatra's poems try to depict india in its stark grave realities of course there are people with divided opinions about the way jayanta mahapatra portrays india in his poems he tries to in that sense realistically depict the uh, poverty hunger diseases and miseries in the rural indian scenario especially in the north indian scenario but then there are also people who claim that jayanta mahapatra tries to present an unrealistic india or a projected image of india from a colonial perspective so that's a divided opinion that uh, critics share in terms of jayanta mahapatra's poetry all right so uh, his poems that have been prescribed for your study are also those which belong to that category a couple of those which stands out are dawn at puri and the other one is hang we'll take them one after the other re recite through that as we did with kamala das a couple of days ago and we'll try to uh, unveil the inner meanings and uh, what is 
what the poet tries to convey in these poems. So let me share my screen with you. And uh, as we have been doing before as well, I would request you to read through this poem. All right. I hope my screen is visible to you. Just in case you are not able to read what is seen in the screen, I'd like to share the link with you. I would request any of you to volunteer and uh, read through these lines. Donat Puri by Jayanta Mahapatra. Yeah, should I start? Yes, please, Bhavnaji. Yeah. You may. Endless crow noises, a skull in the holly sands, tilts its empty country towards hunger. White-clad widowed women past the center of their lives, are waiting to enter the great temple. Their austere eyes stare like those caught in a net, hanging by the dawn's shining strands of fade. The fail early thank you, thank light... You, thank, thank you, thank you, Bhavnaji. Someone else would like to take over? Yes, sir. Shall I? Yes, Preetiji. Go on. Sangiraji, you can continue after that. The fail early light catches ruined, leprous shells leaning against one another, a mass of crouched faces without names, and suddenly breaks out of my hiding to the smoky blaze of a sullen solitary pyre that fills my aging mother. Her last wish to be cremate, uh, cremated here, twisting, unsatanic, twisting unsatanically like light on the shifting sands. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so that's just one recital. We'll quickly get into that poem. But before getting into that poem, have a look at the vocabulary that Jayanda Mahapatra used, the kind of imagery that surfaces as we read through that poem, and see how he depicts the Indianness throughout that poem in different ways. Just a second. Okay. I'll call it. Okay, so just look at the way he has depicted the uh, Indianness or Indian attributes in that poem. Right from the beginning, he brings forth images of poverty, images of death, images of sc uh, scattered images of uh, Puri. Puri, as you all know, is a holy shrine in the north of India. Puri Jagannath Temple is quite famous. Just like we speak about the holy rivers where we go to do the death rites. The poem ends in that tone where he speaks about. Uh, so as the poem begins, let, let's recite that once again and do a close analysis. Endless crow noises, a skull in the holy sands, tilts its empty country towards hunger. See how Jayant Mahapatra puts words into scatting effect. Endless crow noises. Right? Endless crow noises. When we speak about figures of speech, he's putting hyperbole into use. What is a hyperbole? Anybody? So exaggerating speech. Exaggeration, exaggerating speech, exactly. So he uses exaggerating speech when he says endless crow noises. It's not like crows really keep cawing. But then when he says endless crow noises, our mind incites a picture where the crows keep cawing at that particular place. So endless crow noises, a skull in the holy sands, a skull in the holy sands is also part of that ritual. So maybe a skull uh, has come as a leftover, a skull in the holy sands tilts its empty country towards hunger. Look at the use of vocabulary there. Empty country towards hunger. Empty country towards hunger. 
you you don't generally uh, you know use a word like empty with a country it's more of a metonym right what is a metonym metonym is a figurative language which refers to a situation in which one term is substituted for another when you speak about country and empty it does not actually get along well but then here jayanta mahapatra uses that in order to suggest that uh, the state is hollow we are empty uh, with debt with poverty and with a lot of other things so he tries to bring forth these images look at the use of the word skull skull is again an extended metaphor for poverty and hunger it did not be a mere skull alone it could also be uh, the skeletal bones that we would see in other poems so here he suggests that the poor people of a country are hungry or their belly is empty for the need of food we are starving in in the quest for food in the in the quest of uh, you know filling our stomachs white clad widowed women past the centers of their lives are waiting to enter the great temple white clad widowed women past the centers of their lives are waiting to enter the great temple who are the white clad women so widows widows Maybe. yes so yeah that's why that, that word is there white clad widowed women so widowed women who are dressed or clothed in white they are they are past the centers of their lives and they are waiting to enter the great temple the reference is to the puri jagannath temple so they are waiting to enter the great temple and their austere eyes stare like those caught in a net hanging by the dawn's shining strands of fate see how he blends these imagery and makes a sort of a juxtaposed image of a lot of things he speaks about austere eyes he speaks of them to be caught in a net hanging by the dawn's shining strands of fate it's not shining fate but shining strands strands are you know flimsy thin lines so shining strands of fate despite losing their husbands the my again the white clad widows that is worn by hindu widowed women that is past the centers of their lives that is people who have probably passed their middle age in their late 40s or late 50s and uh, they are awaiting to get into the puri jagannath temple which is there in odisha here the poet tries to associate the widows with their eyes when he says austere eyes their austere eyes are waiting the quality here is attributed to the widowed women and he compares their eyes to the eyes of a fish that is caught in a net just like a fish is trapped or caught in a net the eyes of the women the widowed women is hanging by the dawn the dawn's not only dawn but dawn's shining strands of fate here the reference is to the sunlight at dawn which is like a ray of fate or which appears like a ray of fate to the poet again we must realize that he is trying to again make constructions there he is talking about widows who are past their prime who are let's say in their late 40s or 50s and he tries to suggest that they cling on or the only thing that they can, because they have lost their husbands one thing that keeps them going is faith they are clinging on to fate like the rays of the sun the fail early light catches ruined again see how that imagery continues ruined lost broken shattered so the fail early light catches ruined 
like press shells leaning against one another a mass of crouched faces with names and suddenly breaks out my height into the smoky blaze of a sullen solitary pyre that fills my aging mother her last wish to be cremated here twisting uncertainly the light on the shifting sands so he suggests in the fourth stanza he he starts by personifying the early light of the dawn by comparing it to a woman look at the term the leprous shells which is again an example of a personal metaphor he tries to compare the old widows to the shells lying on the shore so just like the shoes which are lying on the shore he says these women are waiting to uh, waiting at the temple so he says that suddenly a smoke blaze of a solitary pyre comes to his you know attention so because you know the dead bodies are being burned or something he gets that sort of a what do you call a heap of smoke that seeks the attention of jayanta mahapatra probably coming out of a cremation pyre so that suddenly invokes his aging mother's death wish that suddenly reminds him of his aging mother's last wish his mother had wanted to be cremated at her native place like something mentioned that the mentioned pyre uh, in that sea show so he suddenly gets invoked of his mother's desire so again he brings those uh, shifting light in the sands where the uh, body is being cremated and the smoke is coming out and he uh, invokes his or he remembers his aging mother's death wish that she be cremated there and that's how he ends that particular poem and if you look at this poem we could see especially uh, towards the end of the poem we could see that uh, in st- uh, the, the approach towards that is also different when we speak about the last part we could see again uh, we could see a sort of resignation from the women at various parts in the poem yes at an extended level priti ji it 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 could be defined or interpreted that way as well they uh, they identify each other by the leprous shells because just like they lay bare in that sea sh- sea shore uh, we could see that uh, these widows also live a life awaiting for the inevitable so we could see that uh, a sort of a resignation to fate not only among these widows past their prime but also in the narrator's mother's case because generally the moment we think about the inevitable inevitability in our life that is death at some point of time we all feel scared and none of us want to welcome death to our life but here we could see that his mother is not actually scared but she is rather welcoming or her attitude towards death is welcoming she wishes to die peacefully and she wants to be uh, buried or cremated in this particular way so uh, there could be a lot of interpretations as far as this poem is concerned talking about the annotation part more often than not these lines have been asked if you look at the previous year question papers okay white clad widowed women past the centers of their lives are waiting to enter the great temple also we come across the lines and suddenly breaks out my hide into the smoking smoky blaze of a sullen solitary pyre that fills my aging mother so these two are not that complicated that's why uh, i'm just quickly rushing through these lines uh, we have already discussed that so far so 
when this be asked, the discussion is also about how, again, what the great temple is. And uh, here the reference is to the Puri Jagannath temple. And the discussion is also about how widows, again, in that area, in that premises, uh, pyres are there and bodies are cremated and there is a lot of rituals going on and in that temple in that center there are white clad widowed women who are past their centers of their lives that is past the prime of their life who are waiting uh, holding on to their fate they are awaiting death or maybe they are clinging on to uh, a life without their partners with the blessing of the god or we can interpret it in various ways uh, at this juncture, I thought of going there maybe a cup, one more poem later, but then I would also like to uh, slightly discuss one more thing before we proceed further, because I keep telling you that the reason why we are discussing these poems in this manner is because you have them for the annotations. So I sometimes take things for granted. I assume that you know how to deal with it or maybe amidst the pressure of completing as much as I can so that I could be resourceful to you. I tend to overlook these things. So yesterday, again, I received a couple of queries regarding how to attempt an annotation. What is to be included in an annotation and what not is to be included in an annotation? And somebody also asked me, you said an annotation should be a, a three, four to say one, one and a half pages long. So how should we uh, prepare it? There's a question that I, I got in my WhatsApp. Uh, my apologies for not responding to everybody for your queries in WhatsApp, because I have a lot of things to deal with in my personal life and professional life. So I may not get time sometimes to respond to you immediately. Uh, so I'll come back to the classroom and maybe try to fit, uh, fill the answers in one way or the other. But nonetheless, uh, I have a couple of things regarding the annotations to tell you right now before we proceed to the proceed any further. So uh, when it comes to annotations, I would urge you, if possible, to try something after today's class. Take any of the poems that we have dealt with so far, or take any poem that you have studied in the blocks, take any three lines or four lines and attempt an annotation. And probably upload it, uh, I mean, send it to me via WhatsApp or maybe share a word file to my email ID, that's totally fine. And uh, tomorrow, when we get time after discussing the work prescribed, uh, we'll slightly discuss how to write annotations, good annotations, that is, or how to score good marks for annotations. I'll, I'll talk to you about a few uh, easy tips or shortcuts to get good marks or better marks or better grades. And uh, in the meanwhile, please think about how to approach uh, these lines when it comes for annotation. More often than not, one popular misconception or rather two simple popular misconceptions about annotations is uh, students think that annotation is about summarizing what is asked. For instance, if you are given these three lines, white clad widow women past the centers of their lives are waiting to enter the great temple. There are people who write a single paragraph and say that uh, widowed women in India who have lost their husbands await uh, at the shrine of Japuri Jagannatha temple and uh, they uh, are extremely faithful and devoted and they spend their life past their primes. This is all that they write. Some people go on to write an essay and they speak about the writer, his biography, who he is, what all awards he has won and then they speak about these lines and that's where it ends. But then more often than not, an annotation I'll talk to you about the structure tomorrow because I want you to uh, express yourself in your own ways and uh, send it by maybe tomorrow afternoon, maybe one o'clock or two o'clock so that I can go through it before I begin my class and I can correct you or I can give you guidelines and suggestions tomorrow. But for the time being, let me talk to you about uh, how do you approach these lines? Every line that is asked for annotation cannot be explained simply by basing on those three lines. It will always fetch you better marks if you, are of, if you are aware of what follows or what precedes those lines given. It need not always be necessary, but in some cases, 
knowing what happens later and what happens before is equally important. Again, to give you a guideline, not to, you know, I mean, it would be better to bring your naturality, but then just to give you a guideline, an annotation ideally consists of three paragraphs. There would be an introductory paragraph. Then there is this second paragraph, which includes the body, which is actually the detailing of these lines given. And there would be a concluding paragraph. So it's three paragraphs that makes up for the annotation. The first paragraph is definitely not or should not begin with a statement like this lines are taken from or the above lines are from etc. The moment you write that you lose marks for annotations. Most of the learners, <coughs> sorry, most of the learners lose marks because they end up writing or they, they end up beginning the annotation by saying the lines above or these lines in the given lines and so on and so forth. You should never begin an annotation by that. Uh, what is RTC if I may ask? I didn't quite get it's it. A reference Sorry. to the context. Sorry? Reference to the context. Oh, no, a reference to the context is a bit more direct and elaborate, isn't it? Annotation is more about uh, being able to understand the lines, which is possible only if you read the poem thoroughly. And you must be able to understand those lines, appreciate those lines, and describe those lines. It requires a bit more scholarly nature than RTC in that sense. Okay, I, I'll give you a briefing tomorrow. Don't worry. I just want you to write something so that I can correct any common mistakes that you guys make. There would definitely be quite a lot of mistakes that you would make. And it is the mistakes that I focus on. Yes, Pratiji, go on. And so I just wanted to know how to understand that. How should we read the lines? I mean, if there is no punctuation, so where to stop and where to like continue? Or uh, like, like if there are many punctuations, we know like there's a comma. Now it's the time to stop or how to know that, how to understand that, sir. Uh, I didn't understand your question. Are you talking about annotations or reading the no, poems? No, sir. I'm just asking about reading the poems. Like here, when we were in the first, second, third paragraph, we could only find a full stop at the end of the each line. That was in the first and second stanza. Sorry, not paragraph. And okay. in the second one, there is no full stop even. So how to understand where to stop and where to continue the flow of reading? Okay. Um, let, let me put it this way. Uh, I, I am I am taking a bit more time on this. Please pardon me for this, but I believe because the questions are coming in, I am supposed to answer that, and also this would be useful to you. I I do want to complete the poems as well. Don't get me wrong. Don't think that I am not covering the poems much, but then these are also important. So that's a very valid question, Preetiji. So I'll, I'll let me put it this way: in order to understand where to stop or how to recite a poem, what is equally important is to understand the different types of poetry. MEG4 is specifically designed for that. MEG4 deals with the various types of meter, rhyme, intonations, and other stuff that goes into the formation of poetry. For instance, uh, if you write in free verse, V-E-R-S-E, free verse, uh, there wouldn't be many full stops and punctuation marks like you pointed out. It would be just a running uh, stream. It's like a running stream. Then there would be works, let's say, for instance, if, if, you, if you read a mock epic, mock epic would have the epic conventions used to ridicule. So to have an understanding of the type of poetry would help you in understanding and establishing how to recite it. Also, like I already told you, the moment you try to recite a poetry or even a prose piece for that sake, uh, it is always good to read silently a couple of times before you attempt the recital. Because when you read, you will be able to look at or observe this fact that this is uh, not having a proper structure maybe, this is not following uh, a punctuation stream, there is no full stop, maybe there is a there are enjampments used here and there. There is a parenthesis used somewhere. So these are things that you would observe as you recite it, uh, for, uh, not recite it, but read it silently to yourself for a couple of times or more. And then the recital begins. So something that you can also, that's ideal to do is also that you identify the division, the structural divisions of the poem. 
for instance if you look at uh, the dawn at puri you could see that there is one two three four five six stanzas of three lines each so there is one uniformity in terms of the division of stanzas again like you made there are learners who end up saying in the division of paragraphs paragraphs is for prose stanza is for poetry so these are certain careless mistakes that we as learners make so if you if you observe that you would see that the the, the stanzas are divided uniformly there are six stanzas which are of equal length of three lines each but if you look at the narration are they the same and then you would realize the answer is no why because in the first stanza there is a completeness to it he speaks about the endless crow noises and he speaks about the skull and the holy sands suggesting that there is a pyre burning to which he comes back later in terms of smoke and bur burying and so on and then he says still it's entire empty country towards hunger so the idea that he tries to convey is contained within that single stanza but in the second stanza you could see that it is actually a running thing it doesn't end there that idea is actually conveyed in two stanzas the concept that he tries to bring forth regarding the white clad widowed women does not end in stanza 2 but goes up to stanza 3 again when you come to stanza 4 it doesn't have a proper ending there but rather there is a break that break is actually suggested by the fifth stanza's beginning and that break takes him to another concept that is the memories of his aging mother and then that again comes to a conclusion in the sixth stanza so this sort of an irregularity is part of this particular poem when you go to another poem it might sometimes be just having a single stanza uh, a poem, for instance a poem that we dealt with the other day had only one stanza or uh, just give me a second yeah let let me share my screen to another poem i'll deal with it sometime later because it's a small poem have a look at this poem self portrait or maybe i'll take it right now that's okay it just it just requires a quick reading and an explanation self portrait by ak ramanujan okay if you look at this poem if it if this is visible to you if it's not visible to you i'll again share the link with you you need not worry about it i'll share the link with you so if you if you look at this poem it's nine lines long if i use the word lines there are nine lines in the poem you can't say this poem is divided into any stanzas and preeti ji's question or query or who is solved here because there is sishura used at a couple of junctures there what is a sishura so brief pause in between lines yes a brief pause probably a hyphen or a semicolon or a full stop that comes in between a line where that line continues is called sashura means a pause so sashura is used in between in these lines and if you speak in terms of prose if you speak about a sentence or a proper ending a full stop there is only one that happens at the end of the poem so how would you read that how do you recite that right let's see preeti ji would you would you mind attempting it just take a just take a few seconds read it by yourself and then try to recite it aloud let's give it a try come on just try this i can also copy paste the text for you in the chat box so that it becomes easier for you okay so so shall i try yes maybe take 10 to 15 seconds reading it by yourself so that you okay. don't get carried away by the pause and other words or something unfamiliar words or something so just take 10 okay. 15 seconds read it by yourself and then side to side wait and no often sign the corner by my father yes sir yes go self uh, self portrait by ak ramanujan i resemble everyone but myself and sometimes see in shop windows despite the well known laws of optics the portrait of a stranger date unknown 
often signed in a corner by my father. See, so here, these half measures helps you read it better because uh, it's it's different from the one that we just learned from Jayanta Mahapatra, right? I think somebody's mute, mic is unmute. Okay, that's done. Taken care of. Okay. So, yeah, I hope I solved your query, Preeti ji. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. So we'll come back to that poem a little while later. It is it is really brief, so I, I am sure that I can get it done in a jiffy. We'll come back to that. I just don't want you to uh, get lost from the mood of Jayanta Mahapatra's narratology. So let's very quickly shift to another poem by Jayanta Mahapatra because this poem is a little bit longer. And to remember this absolutely is going to be a painstaking effort for you. Of course, there are only 20 lines, but those 20 lines are not as simple as it would otherwise be. So let's quickly move on to another poem by Jayanta Mahapatra. And this poem is titled Hunger. Before reciting that, let me ask you all to quickly go through that poem. Maybe 30 to 40 seconds, right? Two seconds per line. Just quickly rush through that poem. And then we'll attempt a recital and then we'll try to do a brief analysis of Hunger by Jayanta Mahapatra. All right, we come to the meaning a little while later. Don't worry about the meaning at this point of time. Our primary impressions would definitely change. Great. Three of you have done your, your readings. What about others? Okay, great Parvati, Bhavana, Ruby. Only six? Where are the others? Are you here? Are you here with us? Am I boring you too much? Seven, eight, good. Nine, ten, eleven. Jinsi, Reema, Arya, Fatima, Fatimat. All right, we'll take that for the time being. I hope others may sometimes be traveling. So that's okay. Majority in itself is a consensus. So let's try attempting a recital very quickly. Somebody please volunteer. We'll take stanza after stanza for a recital. So one person for a stanza. Yes, Sangeeta ji, I think you missed out Neither. last time. Please do the honors. Hunger. It was hard to believe the flesh was heavy on my back. The fisherman said, will you have her? Carelessly, trailing his necks and his nerves as though his words sanctified the purpose with which he faced himself. I saw his wide bone thrash his eyes. Thank you. Thank I... you. Thank you, Ji. Let's take one stanza per person because there are quite a lot of people who haven't read yet. So, Ruby Kumari Ji, yes, go on. I followed him across the sprawling sands, my mind thumping in the flesh sling. Hope lay perhaps in burning the house I lived in. Silence gripped my sleeves, his body clawed at the froth. His old nets had only dragged up from the seas. In the flickering dark, okay, thank you, his heart opened you, thank you, like thank a you, wound. Ruby Ji, Ruby Ji, thank you, thank you. It's one stanza per person. Thank you so much for doing the honors. Okay, it was amazing. Okay. Thank you. Before I, yeah, before, before I ask the next person to continue, let me just add something to what Preeti ji had asked a little while earlier. Preeti ji, now just observe the way Ruby Kumari ji was reading that second stanza. While she was reciting it, she paused here, right? She said, silence gripped my sleeves, his body clawed at the froth, his old nets had only dragged him up from the seas. We should remember there is no pause here. There is no comma here. But then inadvertently, we'll have this tendency to pause because that's the end of a line, if not a sentence. Well, it is not a critique on Ruby G, okay? It's not a critique at all. It's just an observation. Now, 
pretty easy. Let me also tell you one reason why Rubiji would have paused there. It's also because of the habit that the poet nurtures in this poem. Look here. He has a full stop. He has a comma. He has a full stop. Another full stop. Then a comma. A full stop. A full stop. A full stop. In between, he misses one. And we end up inadvertently filling up for that. I hope you are getting it right now. Okay. I hope you are able to understand it further. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else would like to volunteer? And recite the third stanza. I can see a few more hands raised. Archana ji, go on. Archana in the flickering, yes, sir. Go on. Oh, in the flickering dark, her heart opened like a wound. The wind was high, and the days and nights before, palm fronds scratched my skin inside the shack, and oil lamps played house. Bunched to those walls, over and over, the sticky suit crossed the space of my mind. Thank you. That was lovely. Last answer. Someone? Anyone? Well, sir, I sir. Please, Venkatesh go on. It's a pleasure. I heard him say. my daughter she she has just turned 15 feel her i will be back soon your bus leaves at 9 the sky fell on me and a father's exhausted wail long and lean his ears were cold as rubber she opened her warm legs wide i felt the hunger there the other one the fish slithering turning inside Thank you, Vindesh ji, and thank you all of you for those recitals. By the time we have come to the second or third time of a recital, I'm sure you are able to see things further now uh, in this poem. And uh, okay, the poem is titled "Hunger." The moment we read or listen to a word called "hunger," the first thing that comes to our mind is. the hunger that is associated to or associated with food if we generally eat thrice a day and during regular intervals if we don't eat or if we are fasting we definitely do feel an urge to eat and that feeling is depicted as hunger generally but then there is another hunger that is also addressed by most of the writers in different ways and that hunger is lust physical hunger being mature adults the learners of igno would be able to see these explanations with some sense prevailing i suppose this is no attempt at obscenity in any manner or to offend anybody this is just an explanation of what happens in that poem in this particular poem jayanta mahapatra again switches to the miseries that he sees in india the poverty in india so jayanta mahapatra when the poem begins depicts a narrator a person who is a middle aged man who is traveling in a boat and a fisherman or a boat man is being uh, portrayed here and they both engage in a conversation yes this is a poem going by the definitions that i made just a little while ago we could observe that this poem is conveniently divided into four stanzas consisting of five lines each so again there is a sort of consistency the poem has four stanzas which are equally divided into five lines each and uh, a total there are 20 lines it's a 20 line long poem as the poem begins we see the narrator saying that it was hard to believe the flesh was heavy on my back then the character of the fisherman is introduced the fisherman says will you have her carelessly trailing his nets and his nerves as though his words sanctified the purpose with which he faced himself 
So the first line is about the narrator. Then you have three lines about the fisherman. And then again, the narrator looks at the fisherman and narrates it saying, I saw his white bone thrash his eyes. Again, depiction of a skinny body out of grief stricken poverty. Then the narrator goes on to say, I followed him across the sprawling sands, my mind thumping in the flesh sling. Hope lay perhaps in burning the house I lived in. Silence gripped my sleeves. After all this, going back to the fisherman, his body clawed at the fraught his old nets had only dragged up from the seas. Again, an old fisherman, his old nets. Again, indicative of the poverty that he is in. In the flickering dark, his hut opened like a wound. The wind was I and the days and nights before. Palm fronds scratched my skin. Inside the shack, an oil lamp splayed the hours bunch to those walls. Over and over, the sticky suit crossed the space of mind, of my mind. I heard him say, I heard the fisherman say, the same fisherman who has said this in the second line, will you have her carelessly? He says, my daughter, she's just turned 15. Feel her. I'll be back soon. Your bus leaves at nine. So that's over there. The two lines, the fisherman, again back to the narrator. The sky fell on me and the father's exhausted while. Long and lean, her ears were cold as rubber. She opened her warmy legs wide. I felt the hunger there, the other one, the fish slithering, turning inside. I'm sure you're all still confused because I haven't yet gone deep into the explanation of these lines. I'm taking the recital step by step because this is a long poem. Unlike the other poems that we have dealt with, this is slightly long. And unless I dedicate a little bit of time to that, it would be difficult for you to go back to it and do it individually. So that's why I'm slightly stretching it and taking it step by step. So see what happens in this poem. There is a narrator and there is a fisherman. And the narrator is middle-aged. He is hungry. And the hunger here refers to his hunger for sex. He wants to physically involve, get involved with someone. And the fisherman, because he is deeply stricken by poverty and he has a family to survive, he offers his daughter to the narrator. Here, there are a lot of things that we should observe. There are no references to the fact that the narrator knows the fisherman beforehand. So probably the narrator is a stranger to the fisherman. So there are quite a lot of exclamatory marks that should come to us, though those marks are missing in that poem. One, a father offering his daughter, right? A father offering his daughter. It doesn't happen always. There could be exceptions. Yes, we may come across stories in our day-to-day -day lives, but that's not a natural occurrence. Then, whom does he offer his daughter to? A total stranger. He doesn't know who this person is. This person could be destructive. This person could be a maniac. This person could be a psychopath. But then, poverty forces that fisherman to offer his daughter to the strange man for money. Let's recite that poem once more before going on to an elaboration. Let's take it step by step. It was hard to believe the flesh was heavy on my back. A slightly confusing beginning, isn't it? It was hard to believe the flesh was heavy on my back. As we continue interpreting this poem, as we continue reciting this poem, keep thinking what would this line mean? What would the narrator have tried to indicate when he says, it was hard to believe the flesh was heavy on my back. Here, the word flesh may mean his fleshly desires, his deep desire to have sex, to make out with someone. Or the flesh would 
when you read that poem again after completing a couple of recitals that flesh could also mean the flesh of the daughter of the fisherman that he is trying to take over or it could be the flesh of his circumstances or it could also be the flesh of the poverty of the skinny boned fisherman there could be multiple interpretations i don't want to say uh, there is only one interpretation i don't want to limit your thought processes you may have your own observations but then the narrator begins by saying it was hard to believe the flesh was heavy on my back the fisherman said will you have her carelessly trailing his nets and his nerves as though his words sanctifies the purpose with which he faced himself now again let me address the question that preeti ji asked a little while earlier how would you recite those lines will you have her grammatically is what will you have her or will you have food would you like to have food would you like to come out for dinner is all what yeah yes, so what are they grammatically it. what are they grammatically when i say would you like to have dinner with me would you like to have something will you come out with me tomorrow these are all grammatically questions there would be a question mark at the end of it because they are all questions are you okay are you able to follow me do you feel good these are all questions and in this context see how the fisherman is depicted as saying this the fisherman said will you have her carelessly trailing his nets and his nerves as though his words sanctified the purpose with which he faced himself now look at the dynamics maybe this is an error in this website i'm not sure maybe the printed form may have a parenthesis here because that has to be put into perspective is it isn't it will you have her it's a dialogue right the fisherman said will you have her carelessly if you if you don't apply a pause there it becomes will you have her carelessly if you if you read that poem without the pause there it will become will you have her carelessly so that's not what is intended there that's why you have a comma there a punctuation mark there so he, the fisherman said there is a pause again because there is there is a colon the fisherman said will you have her carelessly trailing his nets and his nerves again there is a comma after carelessly because otherwise it would mean he was carelessly trailing his nets and his nerves no so he he said will you have her in a careless manner while he was trailing his nets and his nerves see look at the look at the combination there he was trying to control the nets and he was trying to control his nerves because as a father to offer your daughter to a stranger requires some sort of a courage he is doing it out of a helpless situation so he was trying to stay composed he was trying to take the nets in a controlled manner and he was trying to control himself and he appeared to be you know uh, unaffected and he tried to say careless in a careless manner would you like to have her would you have her so he said will you have her carelessly trailing his nets and his nerves as though his words sanctified the purpose with which he faced himself see there is a guilt that is lying within the old man who does not want to do this otherwise but out of helplessness he is offering his daughter to a stranger and when he carelessly purportedly tries to ask him will you have her he believes this sort of an approach would sanctify his decision or else despite the last the other person could lash back at him saying uh, what sort of a father are you ena thanake endu achanado he thande mole ingane ke cheyo nanga choikkanengi that becomes problematic so uh, he he consoles himself by believing that this approach would sanctify the purpose which he faced himself what is the purpose 
the purpose of offering the daughter because he is poor or he is uh, starving. I saw his white bone thrash his eyes. Narrator says, I saw his white bone thrash his eyes means his nerves were stretching and uh, he was quite curious for the poet to say yes as both of them his he and his daughter have nothing to eat and are starving for food it was more out of desperation when the poet says i saw his white bone thrash his eyes it's more of a desperation he couldn't hide it he says will you have her and then he was out of that desperation say yes say yes because we need food we need money from you so that we can contain ourselves i followed him across the sprawling sands my mind thumping in the flesh sling hope lay perhaps in burning the house i lived in silence gripped my sleeves that pause was an attempt to make that silence visible to you. So silence gripped my sleeves. His body clawed at the froth. His old nets had only dragged up from the seas. So the poet says that he followed him, followed the fisherman across the vast spread sands. His mind was pumping and thumping like it was throbbing and he was trying to support it like a sling that is used to support a broken part of body like if, a, if, a, if an arm is broken we have the sling so just like that he was trying to contain his throbbing uh, heart the poet thought that his sin could be forgiven by burning the heart that he lives in hope lay perhaps perhaps in burning the house i lived in again it could be a literal pronunciation a pronouncement where he says uh, burning my house would save me probably a hint at suicide like it is better to commit suicide than following mortal desires by sinning and by forcing a father to do such a heinous act that could be one side or it could also be the burning the house here could also be indicative of burning or burying one's own extreme desires he he probably believes that maybe he should contain his lust so that he could prevent himself from doing this great sin in this case it's not about him sinning but rather he is forcing a helpless person a helpless father to do a larger sin of offering his daughter so there is a greater sin being promoted here apart from the personal uh, one of the narrator so this shows or this depicts that he was feeling a bit guilty rather quite a lot of guilt of what he was going to do out of his irrepressible sexual desires then the silence of the poet was grabbing him and it seemed that it was gripping his sleeves so a little while earlier we spoke about how the old man's nerves were getting caught and he was shivering in this case his nerves were also shivering probably thinking about the guilt or the sin that he's gonna commit the fisherman looked at his old nets which had not caught nothing but the foam from the sea that is the reference in the last part his body clawed at the froth his old nets had only dragged up from the seas so maybe before offering his daughter to his to the stranger when he went to the seas just like santiago in the old man in the sea this old man would have thought of good fortunes he would have thrown his 
net in the seas in the quest of having at least a few fishes which he could sell for some good tradings but unfortunately it did not happen and he has to sell his daughter or rather offer his daughter to this stranger so while doing that while he again out of some hope maybe he pulled the net out and he could see that there is only froth there is nothing that has caught up in the net his misery is furthered his helplessness is deepened by this lack of bliss or abundance in his net again the word old net is used here the old net the use of the word old net again signifies that he is poor he doesn't have the money to buy a new net maybe a new net would mean more fortunes better fortunes but unfortunately in this particular case he doesn't have that fortune in the flickering dark his hut opened like a wound look at the use of vocabulary or the look at the look at the use of extended metaphors by jayanta mahapatra here in the flickering light flickering dark i'm sorry in the flickering dark his hut opened like a wound flickering probably because there, there would be a randal light over there uh, an oil lamp so uh, in hut there is no electricity maybe they are using a kerosene lamp so the light is flickering in dark it is shivering in dark we just spoke about the shivering of the old man we spoke about the shivering of this uh, narrator and now the light is flickering in the hut and look at the words that he uses in the flickering dark his hut opened like a wound look at the personification a house is not human but here he speaks about wound in relation to the hut so the door of the hut opened as if an opening into the wound the wind was i and the days and nights before palm fronds scratched my skin inside the shack an oil lamp i already i already referred to that an oil lamp played the ash bunched to those walls over and over the sticky soot crossed the space of my mind now see they have reached the fisherman's hut which was quite dark it only had a flickering lamp light which again depicts the worst condition due to the poverty the wind that he refers to here is not actually or may not actually be a literal wind the wind was i that he refers to could be more of a metaphorical wind a storm that is going through his mind not to forget another storm that is going through the fisherman's mind and mind you up until now we haven't touched the storm a third storm in whose mind are you here let me just check where does the third storm occur the fisherman's daughter's mind precisely great i'm glad that you are hooked into the session today so yes we have been addressing the storm in the fisherman's mind we have been addressing the narrator's storm but then we must also be aware that up until this point we are not introduced to the daughter for sure being a teenage girl who is forced into the scenario to save her family i'm sure she won't be in an enjoying stage she won't be like waiting for it but rather she would also be having a storm raging in her mind if this poem be rewritten with him as a character definitely we would get to see that storm as well so nonetheless uh, the narrator speaks about the storm that was scratching his skin uh, yeah uh, where was i okay yeah this is line i'm sorry i just keep missing the line all right yep so a storm was going through his mind and uh, uh, it was bothering him and uh, while he entered the hut the leaves of the palm tree 
were scratching his skin. In an extended sense, they were stopping the poet, or they were attempting to dissuade the poet from committing the sin. We can see such instances in a lot of works. For instance, if you if you read Kalidasa's Shakuntala, when Shakuntala leaves from her, uh, you know, uh, from her uh, home to meet King Dushyanta to go to his kingdom, there are quite a lot of plants and uh, creatures, uh, including deers, which tries to prevent her to dissuade her from going. So we could see quite a lot of instances in literature. So nonetheless, so uh, the palm tree leaves were uh, scratching his skin and uh, they were trying to stop him from committing the sin. So inside this hut, there was an oil lamp which was confined in that hut and which is kind of flickering, maybe due to the wind or maybe due to the uh, limited kerosene that it has. And uh, it was about to die maybe. So in that sense, a little while ago, he makes a reference to the days and nights. But then the moment the oil lamp, just in case it fades out, all that is left is darkness. Again, that darkness could be extensive uh, in, me, in terms of its meaning, in terms of the darkness of committing that sin, that grave sin, darkness of following your fleshly desires, the darkness of poor poverty stricken family and so on and so forth. So the smoke coming from that lamp was filling his mind and he was feeling helpless. He, he the lamp that we mentioned earlier, the smoke, the suit means the smoke. So the smoke coming from that lamp was making him more helpless and thoughtful. I heard him say, my daughter, she's just turned 15. Again, just going back to Preeti Ji's question. How would you recite that line? As, as, as someone who would like to recite poems, how would you recite that line? Let's say in contrast or in terms of this second line, the fisherman said, "We will you have her? carelessly. Now I heard him say, my daughter, she's just turned 15. Just have a comparative analysis there. Would he still be saying that carelessly? Or would there be some emotion? Yeah, what are your hypotheses? How would you read that line? Dear learners, If somebody could give a cue. Hello. Sir, may I? Yes, please. Uh, yes, sir. When uh, he is introducing her daughter to the um, stranger, with a heavy heart, he would introduce my daughter. Like, with a very heavy heart, he will introduce my daughter. She's just turned 15. So, uh, maybe like that. He's not, he's very sad. Okay. Like, inside, he's very sad. But still, due to his uh, pressure, he has to offer him. Uh, his uh, daughter. Amazing, Rubiji. One thing I liked about your rendition this time around is the way you exactly paused at that comma there. My daughter. My daughter. There is a pause there because I I'm speechless kind of, you know. My daughter. She's 50. She's 50. Yeah. Bachiye. In Hindi we say, na, she's bachiye. Kutnyu utiya. Right? Be a little bit soft on her. Don't be too hard on her. She's young, you know, and helpless. But then please be, please don't be that hard on her. That, that concern comes out amidst that desperation, amidst that frustration, amidst the need to, you know, fill a few stomachs and amidst trying to act mature about, about all that. This is where the fisherman reveals himself. And Rubiji, you caught that sense exactly out there. That, that pause is exactly like that there. I heard him say, and look at it. Usage there. I heard him say, My daughter. There's a post there, my daughter. She's just turned 15. And that's why there are three dots there, a parenthesis. Three dots. It's not a full stop. Three dots. 
because he cannot complete his heart is fully overwhelmed his heart is completely heavy he can't speak you know my daughter she's 15 15 and this is maybe imagine him, his hands will be trembling like this my daughter she's 15 she's 15 and now read the next word not the next line but now read the next word how do you read that? How do you recite that? My daughter, she's 15. Now look at that shift. That's how you recite poems, you know. That's what makes poetry recitals pretty much interesting. Desperation of that old man out of poverty. He says, feel her. How do you say that feel her? Feel her there means a desperate Choiceless statement where he says, have sex with my daughter. But that feel her is an indication of what I told you just a little while ago. Bachi hai. She's a small kid. Be soft on her. Don't be too hard on her. Now again, let me go a little bit extended because we are all adults. We are all mature adults. Who would be able to appreciate, understand what, not appreciate, but understand the scenario. So just a little bit of an extension. Why does he say that? Not only because he is a father. Not only because the girl is only 15 years old. Not only because he is poor or they are poor. But also because this stranger, the fisherman knows, this stranger is desperate for sex. And he is a stranger. The point that I told when we began this poem. Is he a maniac? Is he a psycho? Is he a widower? That could be a reason, right? He may have lost his wife and he had his natural physical urges. And he came in search of a girl. Possible. Or he could be a fantasizer. Again, as a cross-reference, allow me a minute of uh, digression. I suddenly remember this masterpiece, lovely story, short story by Padma Rajan, who's one of the greatest filmmakers in Kerala. Uh, he was also a short story writer. Malayalis may have read this short story. The short story is titled Leela, L-E-E-L-A. <clears throat> I don't exactly remember the age of Leela. It must be somewhere between 16 to 18. Uh, in Leela, there is this protagonist who is a landlord. I'll come back to that, Pridiji. That's a good observation. I'll come back to that. So, in Leela, this young girl, sorry, uh, the protagonist is a guy who is a landlord, who's a filthy rich person. And he has strange fantasies. I'm not going to list those fantasies here because that's an unnecessary waste of time. But he does the weirdest of things and he's ready to pay people to do that. And among a list of weird fantasies that he had, maybe the last one or the recent one was that he wanted to make out with a virgin girl atop an elephant. Now see how weird that fantasy is. On top of an elephant, he wanted to place a virgin girl and he wanted to make out with her. And that story traces again the helplessness of that family or the poverty of that family. The desperation of that father. Leela being a very young, immature, adolescent girl. Her fears of being an attempted paid molestation. And what happens is the climax. The climax though definitely would make all of us happy. Should I spoil that or would you read that? I, I really, it was also later made into a movie in Malayalam starring Biju Menon. Some of you may have seen that. So uh, the movie doesn't actually show that scene as it is. But then uh, at the climactic part of the movie, it so happens that the uh, this thing happens. The guy uh, boats the girl on top of the elephant and he tries to climb on top of the elephant. And the elephant squashes him to death and I'm, I, that's the sort of catharsis that we all love don't we 
irrespective of all that we come across in the world that's a that's a that's an ideal scenario that we all like to see to such people so yeah here let's let's not digress further so here uh the father after saying my daughter she just turned 15 says feel her feel her and like pretty said there could also be a scenario where he would have been remembering his own uh, adolescent age maybe back then when he used to be healthy and fit he would have been a little bit harsh with his wife or the women that he came across so maybe that could have also gone behind because that a generalization takes place there, place there like men would be like this so he didn't want that masochistic element to come in maybe so he says feel her and look at the next statement that he makes so that's where he is unable to hide all that he was trying to hide until then the careless approach and trying to control his nerves and yet you know showing that curiosity whether he would take her everything is you know failing at this point of time he says my daughter she's just turned 15 feel her look at the next statement i'll be back soon your bus leaves at nine <laughs> it reminds me of some old school master isn't it uh, when there is a pt period our teachers used to come and say uh, after lunch you have a pt period but don't go out i'll come back i'll take the session so it's just like that he he just all of a sudden owns it up and says i'll be back soon your bus leaves at nine which means you don't have too much time to deal with this and mind you i'll be back soon i'm doing this out of desperation but you don't have so much of time to exercise your fantasies so i'll be back soon that's where the father in him really pops out so i'll be back soon your bus leaves at nine the sky fell on me and a father's exhausted while that line is needless to be explained isn't it should i explain that having heard this much yeah my daughter she's 15 have her or rather feel her yeah right not have her but feel her right <laughs> and you don't have time i'll be right back and your bus leaves at nine the narrator is already in a storm because of the helplessness of the fisherman and his lust is raging his mind is in a battle and to this like a pellet in his ears comes the father's statements one two three four he feels as if the sky fell on him due to the father's wife now we are coming into the last part of the poem it belongs to the same stanza but then i would say maybe it's slightly a little bit apart because it goes to depicting a character who was absent until that point she's just been a passive subject until then now she is introduced to us long and lean her ears were cold as rubber again look at the description long and lean so he she's probably tall but then she is lean again referring to maybe malnutrition or maybe thinness due to poverty probably because she is not having as much food as she should be having she opened her wormy legs wide look at that image as mature adults we may be aware of recollecting this whenever we speak about pornographic images or obscenity for that sake and when we speak about legs opening wide even in literature we use a rather relatable uh, word like warm w a r m or hot but here the poet uses the word warm w o r m puru right see how else can you describe a grief stricken poverty in a family she opened her wormy legs wide again wormy because she is thin she is malnutritioned she is not appealing attractive or maybe because 
he is getting into that worm that is a sin so worm sin death everything is getting intertwined over there i felt the hunger there well not legs opening and the hunger for sex but then the hunger that is opposite of the sexual hunger which comes from an empty stomach that happens inside the stomach when he says the fish slithering it's more of a desperate uh, outcry from the stomach in malayalam we say vaitil eli odunnundu nokka parayille so just like that there is quite a lot of hunger in the stomach and he could see through her opened wide opened wormy legs w o r m y wormy legs the hunger slithering like a fish so that's how deeply touching the poem is jayanta mahapatra exposes us to the deep impact of hunger and what and in in an indian scenario a poverty stricken family have to resort to he is talking about women trafficking that to pre puberty age so he is talking about women uh, women trafficking which is a grave grave subject to deal with and he rather does it in a convincing tone and manner allow me one more digression before i conclude this poem because the moment <coughs> i read uh she opened her wormy legs wide i get reminded of another scenario from a short story by sadat hasan mantu and even though this is a digression this is a useful digression for you uh because you have this particular person and his close friend to study in meg 14 you come across mantu and his portraits on his friend i i forgot the name of that girl all of a sudden Uh, in life sketches autobiographical sketches in uh, mg 40 so mento is a popular short story writer a partition writer his works like toba takes sing or uh, uh, dog of titwal or tanda ghost were all controversial but at the same time exemplary literature masterpieces if you haven't read them you should read them but allow me to narrate one simple story that mento has written in the backdrop of partition all right so allow me a minute of digression to talk to you about a story a short story by mantu written in the context of partition you all know when india pak partition happened or took place quite a lot of chaos ensued quite a lot of bloodshed ensued people went missing and the family people were concerned of whether they lost them forever or whether they were brutally murdered or raped or whether they got lost and there's such a political chaos a father goes in search of his lost daughter he travels from one place to another one hospital to another in search of his daughter upon reaching a particular hospital he finds his daughter in one dark corner of a hospital he is not sure whether she is dead or alive he goes calling for the doctor to look at or to examine the daughter mind you back then the doctors has to engage with a lot of such corpses and rape bodies and other things so uh, the doctor was initially hesitant then this old man drags the doctor to that room that dark corner where the girl was seated in a stretcher so because it was so dark the doctor commands open the window in urdu or in hindu uh, hindi the term is kol do that's the name of the short story as well the doctor says kol do open the window and the moment the doctor says open the window in urdu which means kol do there is no window used there just open is what he says just open kol do the moment he says koldo the body of the girl which was up until then motionless like a corpse started unbuttoning her pajamas and she says 
she uses a cuss word as in camino salo jo bhi hai and she says jaldi karo main aur seh nahi sakta enough is enough i hope you get the point the reference is to grave brutal rape in the context of partition it cannot be depicted any further this beautifully only manto can do that a girl who's been molested by a lot of men lying motionless in a cor- in a dark corner in a hospital when the doctor says cold though semi consciously or subconsciously she unbuttons her pyjamas and says make it fast i can't bear it anymore as men as people whoever who have initiated this partition an entire nation should feel ashamed the moment you read those lines by mento i just remember this when we when we just read that uh, wormy legs wide open it was not a case of poverty though but then because you have mg14 in this cluster as suggested by you i just thought i'll make this external reference as well and uh, yeah talking about uh, this particular poem by jayanta mahapatra uh, it's not only about the lust but it's also about helplessness it's about the mind battles going on between uh the narrator as well as the fisherman how uh both of them are succumbing to their own desperations of monetary and physical needs so hunger can lead us into several such desperate measures and jenda mahapatra tries to enlighten us about what happens in such women trafficking trade centers in india probably it's also part of tourism as well so a tourist space where this guy meets the fisherman and he takes him to his daughter who is struggling in this particular man so that's the crux of that poem and i hope you were able to understand the poem and i really wish you be able to answer the annotations if and when it comes forth again a couple of minutes just to take you through the annotation part so more often than not these three lines appear sometimes the four but then three the fisherman said will you have her carelessly trailing his nets and his nerves as though his words sacrificed the purpose with which he faced himself so when that is asked for your exam for annotation you will have to in the second paragraph that is i'll tell you what the first and third paragraph is tomorrow but then in the second paragraph you will have to elaborate on the scenario the opening stanza of the poem where the narrator meets the fisherman and the fisherman out of desperation out of hunger out of the necessity to feed an entire family offers his daughter to the narrator and even though the word carelessly appears in that second line uh, it actually means the opposite he tries to put in an antique disposition he tries to put in a fake uh, expression and he tries to appear as if he's unbothered while offering his daughter's body to the narrator which is actually not true a stark contrast can be seen where in the last stanza where he says my daughter she is 15 feel her i'll be right back your bus leaves at 9 right so that's where the opening and the last paragraph sorry stanzas are stitched together by jayanta mahapatra Priti ji asked me this a little while earlier, right? This is how some poems are deeply interconnected in between their stanzas, in between their lines. And Jayanta Mahapatra is such a master craftsman. Let's not talk only about the poems that are prescribed for study. That's a crime to ignore the sort of master craft tree that he possesses. I would urge you to go back and read several other masterpieces by Jayanta Mahapatra. which are on these lines a few are mentioned in the block as well just read through K- uh, sorry jayanta mahapatra's poems and you would be astonished by the sort of skillful mastery that he has the gift of the gab or the musing bliss that he has in conveying themes in a in a deeply touching manner maybe that's exactly why he became the first poet to win sahitya academy award for writing in english okay so this is one 
instance and uh, another one that i have often seen is uh, this these three lines and i have also seen these two lines appearing for the annotation as well and by now you all know the significance of these three lines that doesn't mean ignore the middle path but going by the trend if you know these three lines and if you know these three lines and if you know these three lines your annotation from this poem is almost complete how to write that we'll discuss that tomorrow don't worry and maybe this is one homework i have for you i already told you you might you're free to choose any line that you want to but because we have discussed this poem in detail today we spend almost 35 minutes discussing this poem alone so if you want you can choose these three lines and attempt an annotation of let's say uh i i'll i'll give you a word limit maybe uh, 150 to 200 maximum 250 words containing three paragraphs let me make it very simple 150 to 200 250 words three paragraphs that is my suggestion you may feel free to ignore this and choose any poem any line that you want to work on uh, you may send it to me my mail id i had already shared with you anandkrishnamurthy ak at gmail.com or you know my whatsapp don't call me because that phone would always be on silent and i don't call back people in that phone that's my secondary phone and uh, i just use it for whatsapp correspondence so just in case i don't reply your queries in the whatsapp chat be assured that i'll be following it up in the class because again, it will be too time consuming to answer everybody's query in the chat box. Uh, I think uh, uh, Jay Ramji had actually sent me a query regarding the YouTube channel. So is he here or did he leave? Jay Ram, he was there for a long while. Okay, so he had asked me for my YouTube channel link. And uh, the YouTube channel that I kept mentioning from the first class was the YouTube channel of RC Coaching which I think is titled as RC Cochin. And I don't think I have uh, a link to it. I, I'll have to search for that. So even if you search, you will get that link. My IGNO lectures you could find in the RC Cochin website. So there were also quite a few people who had asked me about that Gandhi Smriti references that I made yesterday. It is part of the uh, Ministry of Cultural Affairs in India. And if you are working in some schools or colleges, and if you want to enhance your career skills, if you want to show some certification that you have done, if you want to apply for a pay hike, then you may do these free courses offered by Gandhi Smriti. They have a free course on nonviolent communication. If you access their website, they also have a few courses on peaceful and nonviolent communication at workplace and how to peacefully communicate to students. They have at least five courses running, which are online. They have PDFs. You just need to read those PDFs and they'll have three to five questions which you have to answer and reply via email. And uh, that will fetch you a certificate of completion of that course. And because it is from the Central, of, uh, Central Minister, Ministry of India, Cultural Ministry of India, it is valid at workplaces, whether it's a school or a college. And uh, the chairman of Gandhi Pradi Darshan Samiti is none other than the Honorable Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi. So a certificate which says you have passed that course containing a stamp or a seal from the Honorable Minister's office definitely speaks volumes in academic environments. And uh, somebody, uh, a few people had also asked me for the link of that conversations with Bapu by Dr. Vedabhyas Kundu, who's the secretary of Gandhi Pradi Darshan Samiti. I have shared that in the chat box as well. And then there is a question. Can you share any sample answers of some question from Untouchable Novel? I get confused how to present the answers well uh, the problem with sample answers is i don't get to discuss this in a regular way with any of the students because in igno where i get to teach these subjects we only meet for five sessions or ten sessions and uh, we don't get to discuss that that elaborately where i would come across your answers so that i could share i could share it with another batch uh, in the regular places where I teach, I don't get to teach most of these works. They have different advanced works for study. So uh, that's that's a handicap that I have in sharing the answers. But what I can do is, 
if you take an essay question and try answering that and mail it to me uh, if and when i get time i won't promise because let's let, just imagine 25 people sending me one essay each per day it would become literally difficult for me to answer all their queries read that and give them the feedback but as much as possible I'll try to go through your answers and tell you where you go wrong, where you need to work, or what are the things that you're missing, or how you'd score marks, better marks. So that's something I can do to you, Komalji. So feel free to attempt answering any essay question from Untouchable and uh, mail it to me. I'll definitely get back to you at some point of time and guide you through that process. That I can guarantee. So the floor is open for questions. Yeah, it's 7.22. I'm sorry I took maybe two to three minutes of yours uh the lecture was a little bit dragged but doesn't matter if you have any queries comments feedback any further discussions no, i asked you something in the chat box earlier like it was was it like uh, the old man identifying with that age yeah i i did include it immediately after that i, I did tell you that there could be a possibility of that as well when he thinks about his adolescent age uh, he would have been masculine and he would have thought about his experiences with his wife or other women he had come across in his life and he may have probably had that in his mind as well that is a possibility yes of course thank you sir and i had addressed that immediately after your query i think i was explaining something uh, when you had asked that question so immediately after completing that i addressed your query back then sir, because maybe i was working in the kitchen alongside ah, that's okay that's totally okay i totally understand i understand i don't mind repeating it at all but i was just trying to tell you that i had addressed that immediately i don't mind repeating it i totally understand because the time is such as well it's 7 30 5 30 to 7 30 is a time when your husbands or family members would come back after work and maybe you will have to feed them or make food for them take care of them so it's difficult i totally understand rather i'm so grateful to you that despite all that you are listening to me you have time to spend to me yes so wengdesh ji i think has shared that uh, rc coaching youtube channel i'll confirm that in a second let me just go through that and make sure yes it has my mg2 sessions if you look at that I'll, I'll i'll make things easier for you let me see if i can find my lectures with some chiffy thing let me just check mm. nope it's not there in the playlist but then i can share the link from which you can go and access the other lectures. Yeah, the, the, the first videos, the first lectures link is in the chat box. You can follow that and have a look at lecture two, three, four, five. There would be 10 lectures on MEG2 in that channel by me. It would also include my MEG5 sessions. It includes counseling sessions of MPCE, MAPC, that is psychology and MPCE. Uh, from MEG, I'm not sure if any other sessions are uploaded, one or four or any other uh, MEG three or anything. I'm not sure. But so, MEG two uh, and like five the... are there. Yes. Yes, Rubiji, do you have another query? I could see your hands raised. Nasiba, I think I answered your query. Rubiji. In the first year, I was having. Yes, sir. I was having uh, MEG 5, 10, 7, and 14 in my first year. So for second year, which uh, uh, which uh, MEGs you would sub, uh, like uh, suggest should I take? Uh, that would be relatable like to 7, 14, and 10? Uh, as, as, as I told, yeah, as I've already told you during the first session, I'm not aware, I mean, I'm not exactly aware of the changes that has been made this year. So I'm not sure about the clusters per se. So if you, let's say, if you mail to me or message me, saying these are the clusters that I want to choose from and can you suggest then I can initiate a discussion on that probably so okay, now they so have like clustered okay, okay, like British lang British Thank literature you. at one place American at another uh, African then Caribbean then 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 Indian English literature because they have clubbed all the poem novel and drama in one module no, no, no. See, what I'm asking is Rubiji is talking about the second year, not the first year. 
No, so actually, in the second year, you can choose any of the modules in any of the year. Like it's up to us. Okay, 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 okay. Acha. And so, in the first Then year, uh, the the topics which I had taken, no, are all Indian Indian literature. So, for the second year, I was asking, like. I understand. I understand. So maybe. uh again i think i'll have to have a look at that clusters then i think somebody had shared that cluster pd i mean you know, the syllabus with me on the day on day 1 let me just see if i could retrieve it if not it would be great if some of you can share that with me i'll go through that and let you know maybe in tomorrow's session hopefully where we end this first stretch maybe i'll spend 5 minutes discussing uh the clusters with you Okay, so okay. okay, I'll also find out. I'll, I'll just go uh, to. I'll it. also find out yeah. the clusters and mail it to you. Okay. So. Yeah, that'll be great. So that I can figure out how to. And again, uh, despite all that, let me tell you a couple of things. Despite all that, there are two things that matters. One, as I've already told you, go and have a look at the previous year question papers of that particular paper or that cluster. Uh, go and have a look at the assignment questions, and also look at the syllabus. and most importantly that's the second thing most importantly see if that belongs to your taste like i told you for instance phonetics linguistics aspects of language are not things that are my cup of tea if there is a cluster of that i'll never take that if it's theater i'll jump into it so you may have your own preferences you may have things that you would love to do then you will have your own thought processes there are people like me i told you i won't jump into phonetics linguistics blah 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 but then there are people who have a different approach they would be like i don't know phonetics linguistics so i want to learn it so i'll take that cluster so that's a personal choice so don't go simply by my words have your own opinions in the choice that you make as well and uh, no nasiba uh, i've been urging for that for the last 3 days uh, nobody has initiated the whatsapp group yet uh, 